All right, thank you everyone. Um, I see some participants are still trickling in, um, but let me welcome you to the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies seminar series on the Chinese economy. Uh, I am Meg Rithmeyer, I'm an associate professor at Harvard Business School, um, where I am lucky enough to convene the seminar. Um, before I announce today's speaker, who we're lucky to have, let me just give one announcement, which is that we'll have the second meeting of the semester on Wednesday, December 1st, um, at the same time, 4 p.m., and we'll welcome Professor Stephen Kaplan from George Washington University to speak on his new book on Chinese finance in Latin America. But today, we're very lucky to have Professor Yeling Tan. She's an assistant professor of political science at the University of Oregon. She has her PhD in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School, so not far from us here, and has been a postdoctoral fellow at both Princeton in the, in the China and the World Program and a fellow at the World Economic Forum's Council on the Future of International Trade and Investment. She is currently a public intellectual um, fellow at the National Committee on US-China Relations. Her academic work and commentary has been published in comparative political studies, governance, as well as other scholarly journals and foreign affairs um, and more. And she has this excellent new book, as you see here on the screen, Disaggregating China Inc, State Strategies and the Liberal Economic Order. So we're lucky today to have Professor Tan to speak to us. Um, so logistically, uh, she'll speak for about 40 minutes or so um, about the book and the, the Q&A function will be open. So at the end of her talk, we'll be very happy to field some questions and reactions from the audience. So please do type your question or your comment in the Q&A box and identify yourself if you'd like to. And I'm happy to ask your question um, to Professor Tan. So with that, I will thank you all for joining us and thanks to Professor Tan and we're excited to learn from you. Thank you so much, Meg. And thanks also to the Fairbank Center for this very kind invitation to speak. Um, I just wanted to say before I start that as a graduate student at Harvard, I attended so many of these talks at the Fairbank Center and just soaked up all of the knowledge. So it's particularly special to me uh, today and a, a really a tremendous privilege to be able to speak at one of its events. And I'm looking forward to a really fun discussion. So let's get started. Um, when China joined the World Trade Organization 20 years ago now, back in 2001, the mood both in China and the rest of the world was jubilant. Expectations were high that this event would usher in a new era of liberalization in the Chinese economy, and that through a common set of rules and mutually beneficial economic exchange, WTO entry would peacefully integrate a rising China into the international order. Bill Clinton, putting his case forward for China's WTO entry, argued that uh, under the WTO, some of China's most important decisions for the first time will be subject to the review of international bodies with rules and binding dispute settlement. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers similarly argued that by learning to quote, play by the rules, China will strengthen the rule of law, which will enable it to become a more reliable partner and a fairer society. So why were expectations so high around this event? This was in part due to the strength and depth of China's commitments to the WTO. As part of the protocol of accession, which you see here, um, the first page of China's protocol of accession, China promised a whole swathe of um, commitments. It promised to let the market rather than the state set prices of most goods. It promised to liberalize the right to trade to all firms, so not just state-owned enterprises, uh, to improve the disclosure of information around economic policies, to commit to non-intervention in the operation of the market, to non-discrimination between domestic and foreign firms, to setting up institutions for the independent regulation of the market, and to strengthening the rule of law and governing the economy. In short, these commitments amounted to no less than a Herculean effort to transform China's economy from one rooted in state planning to one operating based on market forces. Now, fast forward to today, and the liberal internationalist promise of integration appears to have been replaced with disappointment and discontent. In 2018, the Trump administration declared that it was a mistake 
to have allowed China into the WTO. In recent years, have seen the number of dispute cases at the WTO involving China steadily increase. China has also clashed with both the European Union and the United States over its status as a non-market economy. And the EU and the US have also shifted their overall postures to treating China as a strategic competitor. Sanctions on Chinese companies Huawei and ZTE as well as a trade war that sees no end have raised concerns that the world is headed towards a decoupling of its two largest economies. And importantly, this discontent with China within the United States is bipartisan. Economic tensions have continued into the Biden administration uh, with both the United States trade representative and commerce secretary sticking to the use of tariffs against China. The US earlier this month started considering a new section 301 investigation that might lead to even more tariffs. And U.S. Trade Rep. Catherine Tai, in a speech earlier this week, re re reiterated that all options remain on the table when managing relations with China. So, therefore, in contrast to this, these integrationist expectations of two decades ago that I outlined earlier, a new conventional wisdom appears to have formed around China and the global trading system. They are, first, that the WTO has failed, to alter China's economic model. Secondly, that China is instead seeking to build a state capitalist model. And third, that this model is being exported globally through Chinese SOEs and state industrial policy. In my talk today, um, I will question much of this conventional wisdom. And part of my argument will push, again, push against categorizing Chinese behavior into binary categories. Now, why is it important to do this? First, there are real limits to thinking about China's WTO experience as either a success or a failure. In my view, it overlooks these really important questions of when liberalizing reforms did take place and why. And it also disregards the puzzles of the specific timing when those reforms slowed down and why. More broadly, political science literature tends to categorize state responses to global rules into binaries, protection versus liberalization, compliance versus defiance. And these frameworks, while useful, tend to impose binaries on state behavior when in fact the choices available to states are wide ranging. And they can choose from a great variety of policy instruments when considering how to respond to global rules. So instead, I argue that we have to consider how responses to these global rules are mediated by state structure and by politics within the state. Now, why do we care about politics within the state? I argue that we care about this because the main burden of adjustment to WTO entry fell on China's massive state apparatus. And I quote here from an interview with a Chinese uh, Central Party school official who said in a journal, uh, that WTO entry is an important strategic move for our country's economic development, but also brings along with it a problem, which is how the party in its decision and policymaking process can defend China's national interest and socialist principles while fulfilling international norms and WTO rules. He goes on to say, the biggest shock to, of the WTO to China is aimed at our government. And we are a government governed by a single party. So in reality, the ones who will feel the shock will be the party's administrative and leadership methods. Now, one might argue that single party rule in China means that whether or not WTO entry leads to liberalizing reforms depends mainly on the leadership and its preferences. And therefore we should just focus on the leadership rather than the overall state structure. But I argue that the bureaucracy and other political actors within the state can often make things hard or easy for the leadership. And I quote here from Deng Xiaoping himself, that once a political line is established, one must implement it. So depending on who is in charge of implementation, those who support the party line, those who do not, those who take the middle of the road position, the results will be different. So it's really important to pay attention to the WTO's impact 
on intra-party, uh, intra-state politics in China. My book, therefore, is structured around two main research questions. First, what are the range of strategies that the Chinese state can adopt to engage with w WTO rules? And secondly, why did some parts of the Chinese state adopt more liberalizing reforms than others in response to WTO entry? So starting with the first question on the range of strategies, to consider this, we have to begin with China's history of reform and opening, um, which I hope, you know, I would assume many uh, in the audience are quite familiar with. This history was very much a non-linear process involving policy experimentation and an incremental approach to liberalizing the economy. As much literature has documented, China's leaders created spaces for new policies around the planned economy rather than replacing it outright. New agencies were created to lead reforms to, to lead reforms alongside old ones. And the result of this layered approach to change is that older mindsets and policies remained in the governing system, even as China's economy took off, such that there was really no agreement within the vast Chinese party state over this question of how best to govern the economy. So how do we characterize these disagreements? Uh, broadly, I propose character characterizing these various disagreements as coalescing around three competing modes of economic governance. The first is what I call the directive strategy, which is uh, one, could, one could say market substituting in nature. It relies on administrative guidance and the state allocation of resources rooted in China's command economy. So one example of a directive state strategy would be the setting of production targets for firms. So rather than letting the market drive production outcomes to set the targets ahead of time. The second is the developmental strategy, which uh, is market shaping in nature rather than market substituting. And this uh, particular state strategy would involve the use of state incentives to attract firm activity to one sector instead of another. Uh, one example might be tax breaks to draw firms towards high-tech sectors. And the third is a regulatory strategy, which I propose uh, to characterize as market enhancing in nature. And here what the state does is to act to set and enforce rules that enhance the functioning of the market. So, for example, in setting standards to enhance interoperability within the economy. And here market outcomes will depend on firms competing on a level playing field within these rules. And then the overall market outcome will be the result of this firm competition. Now, these competing modes of governance are exacerbated by China's political structure, commonly described in terms of fragmented authoritarianism where multiple sub-state actors have the ability and the authority to influence economic policy. So not just political leaders here, but also central economic agencies, sub-national governments. And this means that even within China's authoritarian regime, the, the incentives of these various actors can often be misaligned or even opposed to each other. And that implies that China's economic development is often the product of this internal political contestation rather than the product of an overarching master plan. And the effects of globalization and the effects of WTO entry therefore will be mediated by China's fragmented state structure and its internal bureaucratic politics and com competition between these three um, very, uh, competing modes of economic governance. So now I would like to turn to the main question of the book, which is why some parts of the state adopted more liberalizing reforms than others in response to WTO entry. Here, the book examines a series of dynamics that played out across different parts of China's really vast and very highly complex state structure. So first I look at China's WTO policy trajectories across administrative levels in China's hierarchical state. And secondly, in the second empirical chapter, I unpack the political responses within China's really powerful central government in order to explain what has come to be called the rise of Chinese state capitalism. And thirdly, in the third empirical chapter, I look across industries 
to examine how WTO entry affected China's quest to build national champions. Now, this analysis is obviously highly multidimensional, but the theory I propose to explain China's policy trajectories is fairly simple. So I argue that WTO entry um, essentially introduces two sets of new conditions that actors within the state have to respond to. The first is open competition brought about by economic liberalization. The second is a new set of bureaucratic rules stipulating how the state should govern the economy. And these two new conditions combined have a profound impact in changing the incentives of actors within the Chinese state which again, although governed by a single party, is highly competitive internally. And so I propose that the ways in which various bureaucratic actors respond to these new conditions depend in very broad terms on the probability of being sanctioned and the prospects of political advancement. Now, within this very simple cost-benefit framework, I show that the channels of sanction and advancement will vary depending on where an actor sits within China's complex state structure to then affect whether policy responses are directive, developmental, or regulatory. Now, in order to capture the use of these different state strategies across different parts of the state and over time, what I did was I collected an original data set of economic policies, so scraped from the Chinese internet, containing laws and regulations issued by all arms of the central and subnational governments, covering over 120 manufacturing sectors um, from roughly the start of the reform period in 1978 to 2014, um, comprising uh, a document corpus of over 43,000 industrial policies, decisions, regulations, laws, guidances, and so on. So what this corpus com com contains is basically the overall ordinary language of China's economic bureaucracy. And then I use machine learning techniques to uncover the various topics that are latent in these documents to identify the changing prevalence of directive policies, developmental policies, and regulatory policies, both over time and across different parts of the bureaucracy. And then this data analysis is combined with evidence from interviews, um, uh, from leader speeches, from do party documents, and so on. So turning to the main findings, uh, let's start now with the hierarchical politics of WTO entry. So here, I argue that how the central and subnational governments responded to WTO entry depends firstly on how accountable each authority is to the WTO. And secondly, on whether the industrial diversity of each um, administrative unit meant that a WTO entry increased opportunities for export or did it raise the threat of import competition? And what I find is that the central government at the highest level responded to WTO entry with a surge in market enhancing liberalizing policies. So this figure that you see here uh, shows the results of textual analysis of over 40,000 uh, industrial policies, as I just described, issued by the three, by three main levels of government, central government, the provincial government, and sub-provincial governments, such as counties and townships, over the reform period. And the solid line that you see shows the prevalence of regulatory language or market-enhancing language in the central government's policies, the dashed line shows this prevalence for provincial governments, and the dotted line shows the prevalence for local or sub-provincial governments. And what you see is that prior to WTO entry, right, marked by the vertical line in 2001, there's no real trend distinguishing um, the three levels of government in terms of how much market enhancing uh, language they used in their policies. After WTO entry, we see a stark divergence, and there's a big increase in the market enhancing content of the central government's policies. I mean, this is more so than the provincial government, and um, the lowest prevalence you see there is in the local sub-provincial government policies. Now, what lies behind this surge in liberalizing uh, language in the central government's policies? Much of this liberalizing response was driven by the central government's really high degree of accountability to the WTO. So unlike provinces and counties, 
uh, Beijing plays this role of sovereign representative of China at the WTO. So it has to account for its policies to other T WTO member governments. And therefore in the years immediately following WTO entry, what we see is the central government engaging in a legislative overhaul to strengthen market institutions in China. So numerous laws were reformed, over 20,000 technical standards reviewed to bring China into conformity with WTO rules. A national campaign was launched both publicly and within the government to raise WTO awareness um, uh, both within the national bureaucracy and, and with the public at large. Now that's the central government. The responses by subnational governments, however, were starkly different as I'll show you in two figures. Provincial governments responded to WTO entry by strengthening their developmental language. So market enhancing policies, trying to shape market outcomes. Local governments strengthened their directive policies, market substituting policies to directly intervene in the functioning of their local economies. Why was this the case? This was the case, um, I argue, because subnational governments are on the one hand shielded from direct accountability to the WTO. So the city of Ningbo, for example, if it, if it ena enacts a WTO inconsistent policy, it's not going to be held directly accountable to the WTO in Geneva. On the other hand, subnational leaders are directly exposed to the economic effects of WTO-led competition, which directly and intensely affects their promotion prospects. So those who found that they could compete to expand their exports, such as Anhui province, could be seen issuing industrial policies during this period to spur provincial exports in strategic industries, such as auto manufacturing. Those who were not as competitive as many of China's smaller prefectures and rural inland regions that didn't have as rich of an, an industrial mix, instead was resorted to directive policies to forcibly restructure their industries and consolidate and eliminate inefficient firms. Therefore, what we see is that there was no monolithic response to WTO entry. And while WTO entry triggered initial sweeping efforts to institute market enhancing policies, these were by and large led by the central government. Subnational governments adopted contradictory strategies leading to this internal divergence in China's WTO policy trajectories. Now the next chapter of the book is going to turn to politics within China's powerful central state to explain the rise of what's come to be called Chinese state capitalism. So while the central government, as I've just described, responded to WTO entry with this initial surge of market enhancing reform, this momentum soon lost steam. Instead, analysts started to point to this phenomenon of guo jin min tui, or the state advances while the private sector retreats as central policies began to take on more developmental tones. So this chapter really asks uh, this question of what explains the shift and the timing of this shift in central government trajectories. Now here, the dominant ex explanations that one tends to see regarding this question are first, that it's the 2008 global financial crisis that sparked China's turn towards developmental statism. Or secondly, that it was the Hu Wen leadership that had more state of preferences than their predecessors. And in, this, in the book, I discuss why both of these explanations are inadequate. As I'll show shortly, the turn towards state capitalism preceded the financial crisis. And explanations focused on leadership preferences assume that China's central bureaucracy always acts as faith, faithful agents of the leadership and tends to overemphasize the ideological differences between these two sets of leaders. And more importantly, can't explain the exact timing of the shift. Instead, I argue that the shift towards state capitalism was driven by a combination of domestic and international factors. 
So domestically, one has to consider the accountability relationships between the party leadership on the one hand and the central government on the other, because this affects whether or not the leadership was able to discipline the bureaucracy and deploy the central government as a faithful agent. Internationally, one has to consider the degree to which reform-minded agencies within Beijing could use WTO rules as external leverage to gain influence in their internal bureaucratic politics over industrial policy agencies who were opposed to liberalization. And what I find is that during the Jiang Zemin Zhu Rongzi era, the leadership could effectively discipline its central bureaucracy. And this was in part because its support, their support networks of Jiang and Zhu were located outside of Beijing, right, in places such as Shanghai. So leaders could discipline central officials without hurting simultaneously members of their own network. As such, the Jiang Zemin Zhu Rongzi years were marked by many reforms that were directly opposed to central bureaucratic interests. And they were able to do this in a number of ways. So one example was Zhu Rongzi's Zhua Da Fang Xiao campaign to reform China's ailing uh, state-owned enterprises, which led to this massive consolidation and a fall in the number of SOEs in the economy. Another example was the 1998 administrative restructuring, where in Zhu Rongzi halved the number of civil servants in Beijing and cut the number of central ministries from 40 down to 29. And the third example, of course, would be WTO entry itself, which was met with really fierce resistance by a central bureaucracy that was wary of the negative impact of external competition, as well as wary of the external scrutiny that they would now be, be um, having to deal with over China's domestic policies. Now, at the same time, the initial post WTO entry years in China were marked by really strong external leverage. In fact, it was this external leverage that enabled Zhu Rongzi to push for WTO entry in the first place because Zhu Rongzi, his own domestic support for liberalization at the, uh, during the negotiation years was actually quite weak. And China had also, in addition to that, committed to a clear timetable in its protocol of accession for implementing many of its WTO commitments. China's external trading partners has, had pushed for this timetable. So after WTO accession, technocratic agencies within China that supported WTO entry could use the timetable as leverage to keep the reform efforts going. And this was very much aided by the status of international law in China's legal system, wherein international commitments have the standing of domestic laws. And this is very different from other countries like the United States, where the system here is that international commitments first have to be supported by the enactment of additional domestic laws in order to have any force. So this was, these were the two factors driving the surge of liberalizing reforms that we saw earlier by the central government. Now, what changed? As the years passed, uh, both party state accountability and WTO leverage started to shift. The Hu Jintao Wen Jiabao leadership that took over um, from Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji were different in that their, their ability to discipline the central bureaucracy was relatively weak. Instead, Hu and Wen had to rely on the central state as a key political constitu constituency and this was particularly true uh, for Wen, who, had, who spent much of his career rising up through the central bureaucracy. As a result, the Hu and Wen years were marked by a reliance on the state rather than disciplining the state. And they were marked by an expansion of the Beijing bureaucracy's influence over economic policies. We can see this in Wen Jiabao's failed attempts to restructure the central bureaucracy. In 2003, early reports were that several ministries would be eliminated, but in the end, only one ministry was cut. In 2008, uh, plans to create an energy super ministry were derailed due to domestic opposition. What we see instead during the Hu Wen years is the rise of really powerful agencies such as the National Development and Reform Commission, 
the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, and SASEC covering um, overseeing state-owned enterprises uh, assets. What happened at the same time as this shift in party state accountability was that the strength of WTO leverage also started to decline, particularly after 2005, as many of the commitments in China's accession protocol um, were, were met and, and were by and large fulfilled, which led to a loss of momentum within the bureaucracy. And instead, China's international obligations started to be ignored. The many commitments that China signed on to in its protocol of, of, of an accession also generated a lot of resentment within the bureaucracy, leading to an accumulation over time of opposition to reform. For example, um, China's chief negotiator, Long Yongtu, was even accused of being a traitor who had sold out his country. And these forces meant that industrial policy agencies, rather than the technocratic regulatory, regulatory agencies, gained influence over the direction of China's economic, um, economic governance. This, this, um, this figure that I'll show you right now shows the number of industrial regulations issued by China's industrial policy agencies and China State Council over time. So we can see that from around 2005 onwards, there's a dramatic increase in policy activism by the NDRC um, that was also called China's mini state council at that, uh, around the, that time because it was so influential. And the big surge in policies by the Ministry of Industry and Information Technology after the 2008 administrative restructuring that created that agency. So the age of industrial policy and the age of state capitalism in China can really be seen here. Um, so what was happening in this through in during this period of a surge in industrial policies? Um, a number of really important policy changes were happening. These included the 2006 11th Five Year Plan, which focused on indigenous innovation that privileged Chinese firms over for, uh, over foreign firms. The medium to long term plan that advocated reducing China's reliance on foreign technology. Announcements reinforcing the role of SOEs in China's core and pillar industries, as well as regulations giving procurement priority to Chinese made indigenous innovation products. Now, many of these policies, as they became enacted, had a real impact on the ground, and they were met with negative reactions by foreign businesses who were based in China. The impacts can be clearly seen in this graph that I'm showing you here that shows the change uh, in business sentiments in the American Chamber of Commerce's annual survey of its firms in China. And we see in this, in this figure is that in the initial years after WTO entry, a very large majority of firms actually say that they have benefited either to a great extent or to a very great extent from China's economic reforms. This number falls dramatically from around 2005 and 2006 onwards as these policies come into play. And note that these sentiments are even more negative in 2005 through to 2007 prior to the onset of the global financial crisis compared to the crisis years themselves. So counter to popular perceptions, the rise of Chinese state capitalism really predated the 2008 financial crisis. But what the crisis did do was to deepen and further entrench the shift that was already occurring within Beijing towards um, a developmental form of statism. And more importantly, this change in trajectory wasn't necessarily the result of a coordinated China Inc. master plan, but the product of a shift first domestically in party state accountability relations and externally, externally in the loss of WTO leverage that affected the distribution of power within China's central bureaucracy. Now, what then were the implications for Chinese industrial policy now that China has shifted to this, um, this, this, uh, this period of state capitalism? The final empirical chapter of the book turns to look at China's quest for national champions. So it's key industrial policies and in, in strategic sectors. 
Now, as China's central government turned towards state capitalism, one might think that that really would have brought about a period of greater coherence to industrial policy, particularly in China's strategic sectors. Did that really occur? Um, the book argues that rather than disciplining the state, what WTO liberalization did was actually generate greater policy conflict between the central and subnational states, and that this conflict was specifically widened through a foreign direct investment channel or an FDI channel as foreign capital surged into China with its entry into the WTO. And why is this important? It's important because while both central and subnational uh, governments seek to attract FDI, each deploys FDI towards a different political purpose. And this is gonna lead to policy conflict. So the two key factors that matter here are firstly what the goal of FDI is, whether it's to maximize capital or to maximize access to technology, because FDI often comprises both things. And secondly, whether it is the central or subnational government who holds contracting authority for that foreign capital. Now, the goal of FDI matters because growth is a political target and it serves different political purposes for different actors within the state. For the central government, the central government seeks economic growth for regime promotion purposes. WTO entry therefore represents an opportunity to strengthen the Chinese regime by accessing foreign technology. Subnational leaders in contrast, seek economic growth for rank promotion to advance up the hierarchy of the communist party state. So for them, WTO entry represents an opportunity for political advancement by drawing in foreign capital to spur growth in their jurisdiction. Therefore, it matters whether the contracting authority for FDI is centralized or delegated to subnational governments because that affects whether it's the technology component or the capital component of FDI that's being privileged in any given strategic industry. Now in the book, I explore the effects of FDI in two case studies comparing the automotive sector with the semiconductor industry. In the automotive sector, FDI was relatively more centralized with foreign investment controlled by joint venture rules fairly consistently um, from the 1980s onwards. In the semiconductor sector, in contrast, the FDI policy had a lot more swings um, over time. And I'll elaborate in this talk just a little bit on the semiconductor case study, looking at semiconductor industrial policy. So FDI policy for semiconductors initially in the 1980s were fairly similar to that for the automotive sector with joint venture rules in place and foreign policy um, and foreign partnerships uh, closely controlled by the central government. In the 2000s, a new policy was issued that greatly decentralized FDI contracting authority down to the localities. The joint venture rule was lifted and, then, and this led to a real surge in foreign investment. This FDI, however, was largely focused on assembly and testing. It had very little R&D content, very little higher value added content. And this type of investment was really useful in serving the short-term output maximizing rank promotion goals of many subnational governments, but did not quite go very far in the technology upgrading regime promotion goals of the central government. And in fact, the Chinese firms located in places with heavy FDI uh, presence found it very difficult to break into these foreign enclaves. Innovation is actually weaker in places with stronger FDI presence. And so the central government responded in the 2010 on, uh, 10s onwards with a reassertion of central control, setting up a central investment fund and issuing new policies to support Chinese semiconductor firms. And this meant that foreign firms found that increasingly in order to survive in this new policy environment, they needed to partner with Chinese firms. Um, and that effectively meant a swing back to the joint venture models of the 1980s. So in short, globalization ended up weakening rather than strengthening uh, Chinese industrial policy. WTO entry gave subnational governments greater access to foreign capital and giving them 
therefore resources to bypass central uh, industrial policies that were emphasizing qualitative upgrading rather than quantitative growth. Globalization um, therefore supercharges the tensions that have, that have complicated the central government's relationship with its subnational units for a very long time. And Beijing's high-tech ambitions have in fact been hobbled by the subnational government's quantitative rather than qualitative approach to growth. So to round out, I hope that the findings that are presented today allows us to revisit this new conventional wisdom that has coalesced around China's relationship with the global trading system. Rather than asserting that the WTO has failed to alter China's economic model, um, I hope to have shown you that different parts of China's vast state apparatus, in fact, responded very differently to WTO entry. Much liberalization was pushed forward by the central government, but subnational governments adopted divergent trajectories. And to the fears that China has been building this state capitalist model, I hope to have persuaded you that this turn towards state capitalism was not the product of a coordinated China Inc. strategy. <clears throat> Rather, it was the product of domestic and international politics. So domestically, it was the Huan administration who had a different accountability relationship with its central bureaucracy, giving central agencies far greater influence in policy making compared to previous um, periods. Internationally, the amount of external leverage to be used by technocratic regulatory agencies really declined over time, allowing greater space for industrial policy agencies to assert themselves. Finally, to the charge that China's state capitalist model is being exported globally through state-owned champions, I suggest that globalization has in fact supercharged China's fragmented politics, weakening the overall coherence of industrial policy. So to conclude, while China is indeed an authoritarian one-party state, its engagement with the international economy is far from monolithic. Instead, there's active contestation and competition within China um, between these different modes of economic governance. And rather than constraining or disciplining the state, what WTO entry did was to alter the distribution of power within China's fragmented authoritarian system triggering responses that diverged not just over space, but also uh, across time and across industries. Narratives that frame China's WTO experience in terms of simple success versus failure not only cannot capture these really varied internal effects, they also don't allow us to learn about why liberalizing reform was stronger in some parts of the state than other others and stronger in some periods compared to others. So thank you very much. Uh, my publisher would like me to show you this book um, and to let you know that it's currently um, on sale online, both on the Cornell website, on, on Amazon and other places. So thank you so much for your patience in um, listening to this talk. And I'm looking forward to a great discussion. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Yeling. Um, and I think I should also mention, is this the last book that's in the um, the Katzenstein series or is that? It's not the last. I think there are a few coming um, okay. after mine. Yeah. All right, but this um, this longstanding series in uh, Cornell Political Economy edited by Peter Katzenstein has been you know, a, a huge resource to our discipline. And so um, it's great that the book came out with that series. So um, I invite the audience to please put your questions in the q and um, I'm happy to curate them and ask a few at a time. We're gonna go until 5.15, um, we have time. So, um, so we have plenty of time, but of course I'm gonna take my prerogative. <laughs> as <laughs> the convener um, to ask a couple of questions. One is kind of fair and the other is not fair. So, um, so the, the fair question I'd like to ask is this. So the kind of middle chunk of the book on the rise of state capitalism, you know, I, you know, I, we've, we've talked about this before and I find myself agreeing that this 2008 juncture argument um, doesn't seem quite right in a number of arenas. But I wonder if I could push you a little bit about description versus explanation, right? So we do see the establishment of, you know, uh, of various ministries, you know, MIT being a, a major one of them, which you, uh, which you talk about. 
that are trying to move China, I think we can say in this developmental statism, move China beyond a low value add position um, in the value chain to doing something more technological. And so I wonder if um, the establishment of these central agencies is a symptom or a cause of that, right? And so, you know, another version, a perhaps more Chinese version of the story is, we're happy to liberalize, but it turns out that, you know, liberalizing to globalization and to these, you know, disaggregated supply chains doesn't necessarily add a lot of value to economic upgrading for countries. And, you know, it was our responsibility to see how it worked. We saw how it worked for a few years and we realized that we needed to do more to encourage innovation. And so the turn came from that way. So I guess the part, the reason why I'm asking is you have this story which I think we all need to hear, you know, that um, it's not some intentional premeditated plan to trick everyone into letting them into the WTO and they never had any intention of reforming. But it seems like the argument you're making is that, you know, they really did. Like people at the top, especially Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji really did have the intention that China would honor its commitments to the WTO and liberalize its economy, but it, it, it failed basically. Those, those, those reformers failed to achieve those reforms because of domestic politics and you know, declining leverage um, because of the, the timing and structure of WTO accession criteria. So you know, an alternative version would be they, you know, they did, but then they changed their minds. They saw that it wasn't working. And so in fact, it wasn't you know, a hapless central government, but rather a kind of program to reverse some of China's occupa occupation kind of of these low value add industries. Um, so that's, that's my, I think, sort of fair question. And my unfair question is the obvious one, um, which is to ask you to talk a little bit more about the present moment. So clearly, you know, you're dating the turn to state capitalism in the who when era, whereas most people, and again, I, I agree with you here, but most people think that it's all about Xi Jinping. It's all about his personal views. And I'll just, you know, I'll remind everyone and see what you make of it that in 2013, you know, the language both in Shanghai and Beijing and the hopes in the Chinese business community and the foreign business community was here comes Mr. Xi and he's a reformer. Markets should be the decisive force in allocating resources. And the view was that the anti-corruption campaign was undertaken with the goal of busting up these vested interests to facilitate further liberalization. And then, of course, we get the opposite of that, which is, you know, and so now, you know, for all of your emphasis on China's fragmented policy, et cetera, what we see now, or at least what we think we see is this massive centralization of power. And so I wonder if you could say a little bit, and I say it's unfair because I'm asking you to speculate or, or, or kind of generalize beyond the, the time scope of your work. Um, why did C make that turn? If indeed, was he serious in the beginning about markets and about um, liberalization? And second, um, are, are, you, are you describing a time period that is now historical, right? Are we in fact seeing a much less fragmented state in China than we've seen in the last 20 years? Um, so thank you. Great, um, fascinating questions. This is, this is awesome. Thank you so much. This is really, really um, thought provoking. So, so first to, to the fair question, right? I, I really like this alternative explanation that you're putting forward, right? That maybe it's more of a learning process, right? That because Chinese leaders found that liberalization actually just trapped Chinese um, firms into, into these low value added segments and therefore they needed to um, step up their industrial policies. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I fully, I'm fully on board with that, that alternative explanation um, for a couple of reasons. So first, if it was that industrial policy was what would allow China, China's leaders to push their industries towards higher value added um, uh, segments of the supply chain, but they've been trying industrial policy since the, you know, I mean, since the, the Mao period, um, but in more modern forms since the 1980s, right? And, and those industrial policies didn't quite work. In fact, in industries where China was able to assert stronger control over, over, um, over industrial policy, right, in the auto sector, right? There was a lot of debate um, in the WTO period over whether or not it was those industrial policies that were holding China back, right? That the joint venture model, in fact, was a failure because um, 
this joint venture models were so profitable for China's central SOEs that were partnered with the foreign firms, right? They were producing higher quality cars that were selling like hotcakes in the domestic market. There was very little um, technology transfer within the joint venture, but the SOEs didn't mind because they were, they were expanding, they were making profits. So there was no, there was no incentive in sectors that remained relatively more sheltered with industrial policy, there was no incentive for these firms to to really, you know, go up the value added chain. So I would I would think that sort of evidence can can kind of pushes back against this this learning um, alternative hypothesis. Also, you know, during the same time, which industries and which firms are becoming more successful? It's the private ones, right? It's the private ones that are able to um, be less constrained by industrial policy because industrial policy kind of privileges the SOEs with, with cheaper credit and, and more subsidies. And it's the private firms that have to work in a far harsher environment, right? Um, they only get the subsidies after they've succeeded, right? So Geely, for example, right, was started um, privately and gets lots of subsidies today because it's a really successful private firm. Um, but it was, you know, it was firms that weren't the target of industrial policy that were more successful and were able to move up the higher value added chain. So I, I, that's, that's where I would kind of push back against um, that, that um, potential alternative explanation. Uh, to the unfair question, but also really fascinating question about Xi Jinping, right? So first, um, did he change his mind about reform and liberalization? Um, secondly, is China a less fragmented uh, system today? And so, you know, what we're talking about in this book really describes the past and, and less so the future. Um, so I think I think it'll take some time for us to to figure out what exactly was going on in 2013, right? Now, people were really excited about the phrase that the market would be the decisive force. But let's not forget that around that same time, there was contradictory language coming out from the C administration already, right? About about core and pillar sectors and 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 that national and that SOEs would would re remain the core, right? And in a sense, this contradiction repeats contradictions that were, were um, um, in place that were announced in previous rounds of policy, uh, policy um, you know, in, in previous sessions, uh, major sessions where China put forward its, its economic policies, right? Um, on the one hand, you know, markets are important, or the, on the other hand, SOEs are also important. Like we've seen that happen repeatedly in Chinese economic history. So in a, in a sense, what we saw, the contradictions, um, in 2013 were kind of the same. And my hunch would be that that kind of reflects differences within the party over, over the next steps and over which direction to go. And we've seen over the past eight years or so the direction that, that uh, Xi Jinping's administration has gone in. I would actually kind of push back against the notion that there has been been no reform under the C period. I think the challenge comes in trying to reconcile two different meanings of reform, right? In the Chinese context within China, what Chinese policymakers think of when they talk about reform. And then outside of China, um, what policymakers in, in say the United States think of when they talk about reform, right? And in, in the United States reform uh, for, in, for China tends to mean, um, market liberalization, right? Greater market forces and so on within China. I think within the Chinese context, when Chinese policymakers talk about reform, some of them, some of them think that, they think that um, market liberalization is, is important. In the C period, I think the, ref the types of reform that have happened have been in terms of strengthening control over the economy, strengthening control over what they perceive to be an increasingly wild, opaque, uncontrollable um, economy, right? And firms um, whose assets and, and whose activities around the world were becoming less and less discernible to the central government. And they were getting worried about that. So a greater assertion of control and a greater assertion of, of discipline over the economy as a whole, you know, that is perceived also as reform in the Chinese context. Um, and that's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily fair to say that 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 
that no reform has happened, right? I think it depends on which, which perspective. There's a difference between reform and liberalization, perhaps. Is the... Perhaps, right, yeah. And the interesting thing about the Zhu Yi period that he's seen as a liberalizer, right? But he was also um, a, a leader who focused on establishing central control, right? In, in market-enhancing ways, right? Let's tame inflation. Let's get um, the tax system under control. Let's get the central banking system under control and so on, right? So this period of centralization in a sense, you know, precedes the Xi Jinping period. Um, and if we look at the most recent administrative restructuring um, in 2018 under the C period, right, what, what happened, you know, was actually, interestingly enough, the consolidation of regulatory authority over um, a number of market, uh, market regulation functions that previously were really weak because they had been decentralized across different central ministries, right? So in terms of anti-competition um, and stand standards governance and so on, these have all been consolidated into this uh, new agency called the State Administration for Market Regulation, if I'm not wrong. Right, so that would also be seen as a way um, the C administration cleaning cleaning up and strengthening their ability to regulate the market, which in their um, perspective would be reform. Um, so to the question of is China less fragmented um, today under Xi because he's been such a, a centralizing figure? I mean, I would caution against throwing out everything that we've learned and all the knowledge that's been accumulated over many, many decades of, of what we know about Chinese, Chinese politics. I think that's, there's a lot that translates to today as well. Um, I, have, I have a paper that uh, was published in the China Journal with, with my co-author Kyle Jaros, um, looking at provincial governments in, in the Xi Jinping period. And what we argue is that power doesn't necessarily flow in a zero-sum way in China. Just because more power is at the top doesn't mean that less power necessarily, um, uh, that power has been taken away at the bottom. And in fact, the, the um, consolidation of power upwards has empowered provincial authorities and their ability to be gatekeepers, right? Because resources still have to be channeled downwards, right? And provincial authorities have become more influential players in, in gatekeeping, right? In, in channeling pre preferential resources to one sector over another, to one district over another. Provincial authorities play a really, really important role in China's Belt and Road Initiative, right? And so if we look at the Belt and Road, what we see is fragmented authoritarian politics all over the shop, right? Because Xi Jinping has put forward this central, um, central government campaign. Who implements the campaign? It's the subnational governments, right? And are they going to implement the campaign as, as laid out in, in the central government's policies? No, they're going to use the central government policies in ways that will advance their own, you know, localized initiatives. So I think that um, fragmented politics persist in, in China's and in, in Xi Jinping's China uh, very much, um, very much uh, in, this, in, in ways that are described in the book. What might be different is that we live in a world now of, I would say, low external leverage when it comes to things like multilateral trade rules, right? Because the WTO reform agenda has, has stagnated, the Doha round has failed, um, WTO reform is, is, is stuck, right? Because the, U, the United States government is not making it a priority at the moment. And, and even the US and the EU and Japan have contradictory um, objectives and don't quite agree on really core issues um, at the WTO. So in terms of the ability of reformers within China to repeat the WTO playbook, right? That, that does not quite translate. And, and that I think is a really important difference between what the book covers and, and the dynamics today. The dynamics today, right, is not so much about multilateral rules. It's about, it's this coercive external environment, right? It's the, it's the age of the trade war and the technology war and so on. That's a perfect entree into the next question. So we're getting quite a few, so I'm gonna ask two at a time. But first I think is appropriate to ask um, um, from Professor Christina Davis in the government department. I know she's known to you. Um, and she asked this question, what makes international leverage stronger weak and how did it vary over your period of analysis? And so she says, some would argue that the decline of US influence and credibility after 2008 financial crisis 
deadlock or failure of the Doha round and unfair protection against China all reduce the legitimacy of WTO pressure. But she asks, you know, you sort of just concluded that we're not in a moment of international leverage, but she wonders, would either the trade war today or negotiations to enter the CPTPP um, in the future provide enough international leverage to encourage reforms in China similar to what the WTO entry brought in 2001? Um, so I'll ask that one first and then, I, and then I'll, then I'll move on to, to another one, but perfect timing there. Uh, great. And hi, Christina. Thanks for attending the talk. Um, this is a great question and, and uh, I think gives a lot to think about. Yeah. So, I mean, leverage has has obviously ebbed and flowed over different periods of time, right? As, as you just mentioned, um, and I, we were just talking about in 2006, the Doha round and kind of the weak external leverage environment because the WTO is stuck in the state it's stuck in. So what about the trade war and what about CPTPP? And how does that translate into domestic politics within China? I think the trade war is really interesting in that it, it, it's created um, dynamics within China that are opposite to the WTO period, right? In the WTO period, you could, you could have regulatory agencies and um, reformers, right, to use that ambiguous word, uh, within China using WTO rules as, as external leverage, what is happening with the trade war and these sort of coercive acts, right, the, the export restrictions and the tariffs is that it's empowering the exact opposite set of actors within the Chinese system, right? It's the hawks who can then point to these tariffs and these external export restrictions to say, look, the United States is trying to curb China's rise. In order to respond to this, we need to build up our national um, security apparatus Right. We need to build up Chinese um, self-sufficiency in, in the economy. Right. We need to um, double down on industrial policy. And so what we see is similar dynamics in terms of external rules altering the distribution of power, right? external actions and policies shifting the distribution of power within the Chinese bureaucracy. Here's the hawks and the nationalists and, and the Chinese bureaucracy are, who are now empowered and the reformers who are fairly marginalized because for them to speak out in favor of greater external liberalization puts them in, in a slightly politically sensitive um, uh, position, right? And they're they're exposed, right? As you know, are you pro America? Are you, you know, why aren't you standing up for China and so on? And so what we see in the response from China today is a securitization, right, of the overall um, of the overall uh, economic relationship. CPTPP, I think, is super interesting and super fascinating, um, and how we think about it playing out. I think in two ways, right? First, like what why did it? Why did China apply to join the TP, uh, CPTPP, right? And secondly, how how will the negotiations and if China succeeds in joining, how will this affect kind of domestic politics um, and, and the bureaucratic politics within China? In terms of the CPTPP and how it fits in, into China's sort of overall economic plan, I, I think. I think it's interesting that there are both things that make sense to me and things that don't make sense to me. So if I could just talk it out, hopefully it'll be, it'll be interesting to the audience, right? The CPTPP makes sense to me in that it's really consistent with China's overall approach. And China's been really clear about this, that it's, it's not turning away completely from globalization, right? It's spectacular growth has been fueled by globalization. It's gonna continue engaging with the global economy. China's engaging in an adjustment to that approach in that it's making moves to kind of make its economy more resilient to external shocks, right? And um, this has been encapsulated in Xi Jinping's quote unquote, dual circulation strategy. And there's been a lot of ink spilled over the internal circulation aspect of that dual circulation policy and saying like China's moving to, towards self-reliance and so on. I think too often people fail to note that the external circulation is still an official policy on the part of the Chinese government, right? Um, and Chinese policymakers have repeatedly emphasized that, that they're not closing their doors off to globalization, not at all, right? China during the trade war period has signed on to RCEP. It signed on to an investment agreement with the European Union. It continues to push its Belt and Road Initiative. So the CPTPP falls into that external engagement strategy. And combined with 
with RCEP, you know, membership would give China, um, would really enhance China's economic position in the Asian region. Um, and even when the CPTPP was just the TPP, right, there was heated debate about, within China about whether or not this agreement could be used as further leverage to liberalize the economy. And I think, you know, from the few voices that we've seen coming from the Chinese government, many of them retired officials because current, you know, officials who are still active have far less scope to speak out these days, right? It seems to me that, you know, the same dynamic is probably in play and that there is a subset of, of, of um, people within the bureaucracy who see the CPTPP as, as um, potential external leverage. However, right, it's not going to be a replay of the WTO um, accession because the politics around CPTPP are so fraught these days. And this comes to the part that does not quite make sense to me, right? So China's application for membership has come at a time when China's trade relations with some of the most important CP CPTPP countries has, has been heavily politicized, right? With Canada and with Australia. And when your trade relations have been weaponized to this extent and politicized to this extent, can you get back to engagement and negotiation on commercial terms? I think that's a huge question. Um, the other thing we need to think about is Taiwan's application also to join the, the mega regional trade agreement, right, which adds another political layer to the whole issue, right? Um, for the WTO, countries were really careful to schedule China's accession first in December of 2001, and then Taiwan's accession next in January of 2002. Now, China for the CPTPP has made it really clear that it does not consider Taiwan's WTO accession process as setting any precedent to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right, to that mega regional trade agreement. And then there's this really difficult um, sequencing problem because if China joins the trade agreement first, it can veto Taiwan's membership. And if Taiwan joins first, it can veto China's um, application. So this is going to be the subject of extremely tricky and I think extremely delicate diplomacy. So I think these geopolitical issues, right, in terms of trade relations with Australia and the question of Taiwan um, really, over, really cast a shadow over the CPTPP, um, China CPTPP accession. And then there are other challenges such as the chapters on within the trade agreement on SOEs, on e-commerce, on IP protection. These I think are challenging, but not insurmountable, right? If it was insurmountable, China would not have applied to join in the first place, right? They've been studying the trade agreement for a very long time. Um, and I think that the existing chapters in the CPTPP already provide really important exceptions that China can use to work out um, how, it, how its, ver its own economic governance can fit into the trade agreement, right? It can use exceptions about data, um, within the data flows agreements about using about legitimate public purpose, public policy objectives. It can say, you know, since we're allowed to prohibit data flows across borders when there's a legitimate public policy objectives, here's a, here's a legitimate public policy objective, right? and use these as escape clauses because what's legitimate public policy has not been defined in the trade agreement. All right, mindful of time, thank you. This is, um, this is fascinating. I'm gonna ask a couple of, um, of smaller questions together. Um, one you know, from um, TK Chu is thanks for a thoughtful presentation. And the question is about the efficacy of China's state capitalist system. So if we compare the USSR pre-1989 central planning economy, the USSR one did not work and the Chinese one has worked. Um, I, I assume he means in terms of growth, advancement, et cetera. So what are the one or several factors that led to this difference? Why has China's state capitalism been successful um, or central planning, which I don't know if you would call it central planning, but in any case, I'll leave it there. Um, and the second question um, is from Li, is from Jingli, Li Jing, is thank you so much for your fascinating talk. Could you please explain a little bit more about why you think the Hu Win administration has a weaker account of, had a weaker accountability relationship with the bureaucracy than the previous administration? Um, so does your book draw on rich text data to explain this comparison? Um, so I'll leave those there, thanks. Uh, great, thank you. So on this question of efficacy, I would um, encourage everyone to read uh, Yuan Yuan Ang's two books, right? Um, first, How China Escaped the Poverty Trap and her more recent book on China's 
gilded age, which is how China managed to grow so successfully despite having massive amounts of corruption. And also Isabella, Isabella Weber's new book on how China escaped shock therapy. I think those books really point to um, the secret sauce, right? And, and, and give us a really clear comparison on China's growth experience and how it was different from that of the Soviet Union. And there's a whole set of literature prior to these books coming out, looking at China's experimental approach to growth, right? Sebastian Hellman's um, work on policy experimentation, um, economist Tian Ying Yi's works on, on, on um, federalism um, and so on, uh, fiscal federalism. So, so you know, I would I would point to there's there's a huge amount of um, literature talking about why the Soviet Union or you know post Soviet um, economics in terms of adopting you know those those economies ad adopting shock therapy right that sent those um, post communist countries along a certain path and then China's own communist regime adopted a really different set of um, approaches when it came to this question of how to grow the economy after Mao Zedong died right they they. Um, as I mentioned a little bit in the talk, right? They they adopted this experimental approach by by empowering local governments to look for the best ways to grow, right? Um, and this came in the form of some policy experiments that were really subversive, like the household responsibility system, right? But, but when when it came when when it was shown that it was really successful, the central government then adopted it and um, encouraged localities to adopt uh, to adopt it. Um, experiments along the coast in terms of the special economic zones, right? When that was shown to be uh, successful, it was expanded along the coast in the 1990s, right? And then from there further expanded when China joined the WTO, trade liberalization and trade liberal trade rules were applied to the entire economy. So I think this question of, of why China was more successful in relative terms, um, there's a rich set of literature to address that. I would. I would caution to uh, to say that the system is is efficacious in all at all times and in all segments because there's also a rich set of literature talking about how China's policies end up being really poorly implemented, right? So has China succeeded in spite of its industrial policies, or has it succeeded because of its of its industrial policies? I think is is a real question. Um, and on the second question. I'll speak quickly because I'm I'm worried that we're out of time very soon on why the Huwen administration accountability relationship with with its central government was weaker. Um, in the book, um, the it, uh, I draw on a number of different sources. Uh, a lot of it has to do with interviews with retired government officials um, and as well with. Um, uh, public policy managers within firms that have to interface with the government and, and them talking about differences uh, between who and when, uh, between who and Jiang and Zhu, you know, retired, retired government officials kind of talking about differences and so on, um, as well as just looking at major events in each set of leaders administration in terms of how how well were they able to achieve policy objectives that directly undermined the central government's objectives, right? Because in cases where the central government's objectives and the leadership objectives, um, the, where those are aligned, right? You won't get a conflict. So then it's really hard to tease out the accountability relationship. So we need to look for instances where the two are misaligned to be able to um, identify when it is that the central government is able to discipline the bureaucracy and, and, and kind of, um, use the central government as a faithful agent or when it has to rely on the government as a, a key political constituency. So I look at these key events, right? The 1998 administrative restructuring versus, uh, that Zhu Rongzi very effectively did versus the ones in 2008 that, who, uh, that Wen Jiabao tried to do and largely failed. Um, SOE reform is another example and WTO um, entry is another example. So I hope that answers your question. Perfectly on time. How elegant. <laughs> so, um, I mean, we have more questions. We could keep going on. 
Um, but we will give uh, Professor Tan, who's based in Oregon now, her afternoon back um, <laughs> to work. <laughs> and we're at the end of our workday here. Um, but thank you so much for this presentation um, and for, you know, for sharing the research with us. And thanks to everyone who was able to attend and ask thoughtful questions. I'll look forward to seeing hopefully most of the audience back in early December. Um, but in the meantime, thank you so much, Yelling. Thank for you that. so much, Meg. And thanks, everyone, for uh, staying for this talk. And thanks for the great questions. That's been really fun. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.